Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to the Wake Up Broadcast for April 2004. Today we're going to continue our investigation into God's clocks. Specifically, we are looking into the operation and importance of the Jubilee calendar. This is a subject that many people have not thoughtfully considered. I have to confess that at first the Jubilee calendar appears to be more complex than it really is, but I think it's largely because we don't use God's clocks for measuring time today. We use man-made clocks. The Jubilee calendar is very important though if you want to understand how God measures time in the books of Daniel and Revelation. There are 18 prophetic time periods in Daniel and Revelation, and all of these prophetic time periods operate according to God's clocks, not man's clocks. In other words, they have a very different synchrony. God's clocks start and stop on a schedule that is unlike the clocks we use today. So that's why it's important to understand God's clocks and their synchrony. As we go through today's study, which is probably one of the most complicated studies I've ever tried to present, I want you to remember this statement. With God, timing is everything. Now the reason that I say that this is one of the most difficult presentations I've ever given is because this involves so much information and since you aren't here to ask a question when something doesn't seem very clear to you, I may charge right on ahead without fully answering the question that's in your mind. So if you are watching this on tape or DVD or on the internet, I hope that you will go back and review this presentation today uh, several times if necessary until it makes sense to you. I've done my very best to try to make this matter as easy to understand as I know how. Now, I want to give you a couple reminders from our study in the previous seminar segment. Let's go to the uh, camera here, camera uh, two, and I want you to, you may recall looking at this uh, picture, and uh, I want to remind you that a day in God's clock is one rotation of the earth on its axis. So from sundown to sunrise and back to sundown is one day. So you could say that the day actually starts right here at sundown and then as we rotate here is midnight, here is morning, here is noon, and here is sundown. That in God's clocks is one day. Now, you also know how that in God's clocks a new moon, which is totally dark, there's no, you can't see a new moon, marks the beginning of a new month. And so then a couple of days after the new moon we have the first crescent, the sighting of the first crescent. And then the crescent grows larger and we're able to see the phases of the moon until we get to a full moon and then the moon begins to wane into darkness and finally we see the last crescent of the moon and then as it moves toward the new moon. This cycle from new moon to new moon takes 29 and a half days and um, God always starts his months with a new moon and not the sighting of the first crescent. I'll, I'll prove that from the Bible later on. So you understand what the day is, you understand what the month is, and you understand, I'm sure already, what the synchrony of the weekly cycle is all about. Here, let's take a look at um, the weekly cycle. The weekly cycle was synchronized at creation so that the first day of creation 
and every Sunday thereafter, the first day of the week, always synchronizes. And the week was terminated with uh, the seventh day, or the holy day, God's day of rest. And, and the Sabbath is what terminates the weekly cycle so that it starts over and we have a seven-day week. Now, I want you to understand that seven days are in a week, but seven days aren't necessarily a week. A week has to begin, now I'm talking about a week, a week itself has to begin with the first day and end with the seventh day of the week. I mean, you would think that makes sense, but that's not how we speak of time today. If you're leaving on vacation on Wednesday, and you're going to be back the following Tuesday, people say, I'll be back a week later. Well, that you should say, to be proper, I'll be back seven days later. Because a week is not just any seven days. A week starts with Sunday and always ends with Sabbath. And there's always that order of seven days to make a week. Now, these synchronies are important because... God uses these synchronies throughout the Bible and Bible prophecy. A Jubilee week, for example, is a seven-year period of time that begins with a Sunday year and ends with a Sabbath year. Uh, the Sunday year, in the case of the uh, Jubilee week, is synchronous with the year of the Exodus. The Sunday year always aligns with the year of the Exodus, that is, in the Jubilee, uh, Jubilee weeks. Let's go to the computer screen, and uh, let me share a couple of things with you. God's clocks have a special synchrony, and the 18 prophetic time periods in Daniel and Revelation require an understanding of their synchrony. Look closely at the following words. We're going to go now to Daniel 9, and we're going to take on a prophecy that is largely misunderstood today by most Christians. We're going to try to clear, clarify this and make sense of it, so please uh, buckle your seats and pay close attention. I want to read the next four verses, portions of them, just so that you understand what I'm going to be talking about. Daniel is in Babylon. The Babylonian captivity is underway. You know, it lasted for 70 years. And God sent Gabriel to Daniel with this message. Seventy weeks, seventy weeks, keep that in mind, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. I'm reading from the King James Version. God is going to give Israel 70 weeks of time to finish their transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. In the larger picture, what God is really saying is that if Israel will cooperate with him, in 70 weeks, he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. I've talked about this extensively uh, in the Ezekiel seminar series that I recently did. And if you haven't seen that series, I hope you will either watch it on the internet or you will get a set of DVDs to study it because it's amazing. It's a powerful study. God is telling Daniel that he has a plan and that in 70 weeks, he's going to finish transgressions He's going to make an end of sins, and he's going to make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. And if Israel is cooperative, he's going to seal up this vision and prophecy so that what we are studying today would not have been known. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and build Jerusalem. See, Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the city. So know and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, or decree, to restore and to build Jerusalem 
unto the Messiah, the Prince, that is the Anointed One, Jesus, there shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, or sixty-two weeks. So God divides up sixty-nine weeks by calling it a seven and a sixty-two. Why did he do that? We'll examine that in just a minute. Verse 26, And after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Meaning, Messiah, after the sixty-two weeks, would be disinherited. Disinherited. And verse 27 says, And he, that is the Messiah, shall confirm the covenant the covenant given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Messiah will confirm the covenant of a Savior for many, or with many, for one week. And in the middle, or the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, in the middle of the 70th week, the Messiah will cause the sacrificial system to cease. Now, I know that this is not how Daniel 9 is typically interpreted, but the scripture plainly says we're talking about the Messiah, the anointed one, who will confirm the covenant and will cause sacrifice and oblations to cease. There is only one who meets that specification, and that's Christ. I'm going to show you, though, that this whole prophecy, Daniel 9, 25, 26, 27, and 28, that all of these statements have been fulfilled with a precision that is overwhelming. I will try to explain and demonstrate their fulfillment, and we will begin by noticing that 70 weeks of years equals 490 years. So the decree... And the, and, the, and the commencement of the 70 weeks marks a clock, if you will, that's going to be ticking for 70 weeks or 490 years because 70 times 7 is 490. For centuries, Christians have widely agreed the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 have to be translated into 490 years, but they could not figure out why. Yes, they cooked up various reasons why 70 weeks equal 490 years. But they reached the right answer in Daniel 9, but they made a big mess out of Daniel 12 and portions of Revelation which have time periods, prophetic time periods, that do not use the Jubilee calendar. Many Christians believe that in Bible prophecy, a day always equals a year because of what happened in Daniel 9. But that view makes a big mess and ruins the intended meaning of Daniel 12 and other portions of Revelation. Remember, there are 18 prophetic time periods. The book of Daniel was sealed up until the time of the end. We know that to be true because Gabriel told Daniel that in Daniel 12 verses 4 and 9. So the unsealing of the book of Daniel is the discovery of the rules that govern apocalyptic prophecy, that govern the interpretation of apocalyptic prophecy. Rule 4 says this, the presence or the absence of the Jubilee calendar determines how God measures time. If the calendar is operating, a day is translated according to the calendar. If not, God measures time without translation. So, when the Jubilee calendar is operating, God uses a Jubilee week to identify seven years. Seven years. And these seven years are synchronous with the Exodus because they are called a week. The Jubilee calendar. Let me take, let me show you, let me just remind you of this picture here. The Jubilee calendar began operating 
two weeks before the Exodus, and the year is 1437 B.C., and you can see that it's a Sunday year, and it's the first year in the cycle of 49 that will come about. And so the first Sabbath year is 1431 B.C., and the Sabbath being the seventh year, seventh day, seventh year. So when God says 70 weeks, this is a week, and the week has to remain synchronous with the, ex the year of the Exodus. So here's a Sunday, here's a Sunday, here's a Sunday, and so forth. And so that when we get down to the uh, time of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, let me see if I can put that on the screen here for you. Give me just a second, please. Uh, let's go to camera two and notice that um, when we get to camera uh, two, here on camera two, you can see that the great day of Tuesday is going to be 70 weeks starting with 457 B.C. and then each week following and this is synchronous with the year of the Exodus. Let me slide this over back to the great day of Sunday and you can see the Exodus year is right here. The year of the Exodus is 1437. So we have a synchrony that is being accomplished through the Jubilee calendar. And when God says 70 weeks, He means exactly what He says. In other words, the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 have to be translated into 70 weeks of years because the Jubilee calendar is operating. And 70 weeks of years total 490 years. Okay? But it's not just any 490 years. God could have said, 490 years are decreed upon your people, Daniel, but that would not have offered any synchrony. But when God said 70 weeks, then that automatically means that the decree is going to be issued in a Sunday year that is synchronous with the year of the Exodus. Because the weekly cycle of years in the Jubilee calendar began with the Exodus. I, I hope I'm making sense to you. Let's go back to the computer screen. Since a Jubilee cycle is 49 years in length, 490 years can make up 10 Jubilee cycles if or as long as synchrony permits. So 49 plus 49 plus 49 10 times is 490 years. 10 Jubilee cycles. A Jubilee cycle is 49 years, recurring cycles of 49, and 10 of those would be 490 years. In other words, 70 weeks is the same thing as 490 days, which is the same thing as 10 Jubilee cycles. They all have the same duration of time, but each of these clocks has a different synchrony. And it's only when you align them correctly that they can all be the same period of time. I hope that makes sense to you. It's only when they are aligned correctly. And that is they have to be in alignment with the year of the Exodus. Notice the year of the Exodus here I have in this green little character, actually it turns purple on the screen when I highlight it. So the Exodus is a Sunday year, and the year after was a Monday year, and the year after was a Tuesday year, and so forth. And the first Sabbath year occurred in 1431 B.C. This is 1437, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1431 B.C. And that completes the first week of years. And we are in the first Jubilee cycle. Make sense? Then when we get down to the 49th year, 
in this first cycle. That is the Sabbath year of the seventh week. Seven times seven is 49. So 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, 49 years is seven weeks of years. And the first Jubilee year, which Israel celebrated, occurred right here in what year is known as 1388 B.C. And that is the first week of the second Jubilee cycle. In other words, when God said 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel, you're, when you're talking about a week, you're talking about a unit of time that's where Sunday is the first day and Saturday is the seventh day and it has to be synchronous with the Exodus. I hope that makes sense to you. The year of Jubilee is both the 50th year of the old cycle and the first year of the new cycle. This confuses a lot of people. See, here's the 48th year, here's the 49th year, here's the 50th year, but the 50th year is Sunday, which is also the first day of the next Jubilee cycle. It's the first year of the, of the first week in the second Jubilee. So the 50th year and the first year are the same year. You get two for one. <laughs> Incidentally, the same model. Now, this, this isn't hard to understand if you are aware of it, but it just takes a little while to get accustomed to it. The same model of days was used to determine the Feast of Pentecost because the 50th day of Pentecost always fell on Sunday, the first day of the week. In other words, if you were counting uh, from Passover, the Lord told uh, Israel there in Leviticus 23 to start counting on the first Sunday after Passover, count off seven full weeks, and then the Feast of Weeks, the day of Pentecost, would be the 50th day, and it always falls on Sunday. So we have a 50 and a first, the 50th day and the first day being the same thing, and so you have in the count for the Feast of Pentecost a miniature of the Jubilee cycles and how they work. They are identical. Because the weekly cycle has synchrony, the weekly cycle cannot be interrupted nor can the Jubilee cycle be interrupted. And this is a hard thing for a lot of people to swallow because they've been told different all their life. But the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 70 weeks have to be 490 consecutive years. You cannot separate the 69th and the 70th weeks. That is impossible. That's like putting an extra day between Tuesday and Wednesday. It's impossible because after Sunday ends, Monday begins. After Monday ends, Tuesday begins. After Sabbath ends, Sunday begins. There is no space of time in the weekly cycle. The 70 weeks have to be, I'll make that right there, have to be 490 consecutive years. A lot of people try to make Jubilee cycles 50 years in length and this, this won't work either. They'll start counting Sunday of the Exodus, Sunday year, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and so they count off the first week of the first Jubilee cycle. And so they start counting and pretty soon they get down to week 7 and here's the 49th year and then they want to make the 50th year the Sunday year and get this, they want to make the first, the first year of the next cycle a Monday year. Well, that's going to put Sunday as the seventh year in the cycle. That's, that's going to make Sunday the seventh year in the first week of the second Jubilee cycle. You can't start a week on Monday. That is not the first day of the week. And in fact, if you carry this out to its logical conclusion, in the third Jubilee cycle, then Monday is the 50th year. Now Tuesday becomes the first day in the week of years. And that makes God's seventh day Sabbath, or his seventh year now, the fifth day of the week. And even worse, carrying this 
uh, even, even further. Because of synchrony, there is a specific alignment of the 70 weeks that cannot be manipulated. Think about this for a minute. If the 50th year of the old cycle is not the first year of the new cycle, then the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 would be 499 years in length because you constantly have to keep inserting a jubilee year after every seven years. And since there would, are 10 sets of seven weeks to make 70 weeks, you're going to have nine jubilee years in there. So the, 490, so the 70 weeks would actually have to cover a period of 499 years. And, and no one believes that. In fact, it's not possible. I just explored this possibility to show you that it's only when you get it right that all the pieces will actually fit together. Why did God say 70 weeks are determined upon thy people when he could have said 490 years are determined upon thy people? Why did he say weeks instead of just coming right out and saying 490 years? Well, the answer is this. God is giving a big hint to those who are searching out His ways. So God said 70 weeks to indicate the all-important decree would be synchronous with the year of the Exodus, whereas the synchrony of a year by itself is just the first new moon on or after a spring equinox. In other words, if God had said 490 years, they could have started with any new year. But, a week of years has to start with a Sunday year that is synchronous with the Exodus. Look again. You can see that when we start the weekly cycle flowing from the Exodus, the week of years, when he said 70 weeks, he's talking about a decree that will be issued in a Sunday year that will line up with the year of the Exodus. And when we come... Uh, when we begin our next segment, we're going to see even more clearly how marvelous God is. The things He is able to say with such few words. And the, then the fulfillment, when we get toward the end of today's study, the fulfillment of these things is truly an astonishing thing to understand. Well, with God, timing is everything, and we're out of time. So we will resume in just a moment.